Today we're going to start the vertebrates chapter, which is chapter 34. Um, we're going to only be doing about half of the lecture today, so we'll be filling out pages 106 through 107 in our course pack. So make sure you have that with you today. We're returning to our course pack and filling out just a couple of pages of notes. This tree right here is um, figure 34.2, and um, you will be given this tree on your exam. And as we go through each group of chordates, you're going to mark the feature that appears with each new lineage. Before we get started on the individual groups and uh, classes within the phylum chordata, I'm going to give you an overview of what some of the concepts are. For the full list of concepts, you'll want to check pages 110 to 111. This is what I consider to be sort of our big picture concepts. So for each diverging clage of lineage, or chordates, for example, here we have the divergence of the entire phylum chordata, and we learned that in um, the phylum chordata we had four key traits that appeared within that. And so we'll list what those four key traits are. And that became the entire phylum chordata. Alright, so with each new lineage, what structural feature has appeared? And then how does that feature relate to that organisms or that class's group or phylum, um, their lifestyle or ecology? Uh, once we get down to the amphibians, reptiles, and mammals, these classes are going to have several different orders within them that we're going to discuss. And so you're going to be responsible for knowing the differences between animals and the different groups of amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. And it doesn't say this on this chart, but for many of the groups, we're going to learn about um, other structural features that relate to their uh, lifestyle or ecology. So whenever you see a notable structure, write that down. If you see anything about reproduction uh, or development, make sure you note that as well. And then finally, uh, if you see anything about the respiratory or, di or um, circulatory system, note that as well. For the respiratory system, I'm largely referring to whether the animals will have gills or lungs, and this will probably depend on whether they're aquatic or terrestrial. And for the circulatory system, you'll note if it's in the slides. If it's not in the slides, you don't have to worry about it, but you're going to note whether animals have a two, three, or four chambered heart. All right, so again, here is an overview of that figure with all of the features um, being shown um, at these purple tick marks and the major classes within the phylum chordata listed to the right. Note that the phylum echinodermata is shown here in relation to the phylum chordata, but it is not a member of the phylum chordata itself. Echinoderms, like chordates, are both deuterostomes. So in this clade right here, we've got the deuterostomes. All right. And so these two groups right here, the landslits and the tunicates, we've already discussed them. These were our invertebrate chordates. And so we've already talked about them. As we go through the rest of them, we're going to first define each animal as whether it's a vertebrate, a nathosome, an ostichthian, a lobefin, a tetrapod, or an amniote. So let's go ahead and cover all of those terms right now before we get into each individual class. And we're going to use this um, figure right here to help us with our definitions. So for the phylum chordata, 
a good definition could be any member of the phylum chordata. Um, or it could be animals that have a notochord and the other three features of a chordate. So a chordate would be any animal within the phylum chordata. And it would have, at some point in their development, four of these features. And this is review. So the four features were a dorsal hollow nerve cord, a notochord, that muscular post-anal tail, I'm just gonna say tail here, and then finally those pharyngeal slits or clefts, which will develop into the gills in aquatic and chordates. Okay, and so now vertebrates are going to include everything from the hagfish down to the mammals. And so with this lineage, we see the development of vertebrae or a backbone. So the def to define a vertebrate, we would say it is a chordate with a backbone or a vertebrae. Not all vertebrates have full vertebrae that go down the entire length of their spinal column or their nerve cord. Some will only have uh, vertebrae right at the base of the skull. But they are bones surrounding the nerve cord, and so they are considered vertebrae, and thus the animals are considered vertebrates. And so all vertebrates are chordates, but as we go down, not all chordates will be vertebrates. And likewise, cyclostomes are going to be a type of vertebrate, but not all vertebrates are cyclostomes. So cyclostomes, we don't have any key features that derive with these. Um, the uh, cyclostomes are just going to be the vertebrates that don't have a jaw. The nathostomes, on the other hand, are going to be vertebrates with a jaw. So this is an important evolutionary adaptation that allows for a more effective ingestion and predation. So we have our vertebrates with a jaw and also a mineralized skeleton. The skeleton isn't really a bony skeleton. The um, first nathostomes include sharks and rays, and they have a cartilage skeleton. But the cartilage skeleton is fortified with minerals, so it's um, a little bit tougher than just um, raw cartilage tissue. Um, so here we have, I'm going to go back to this figure. Here, our nathostomes are going to be everything from the chondrichthians down, and the traits that evolve with this lineage are the jaw and the mineralized skeleton. Next, we're going to have our ostichthians, and ostichthians are going to include everything from the ray finned fishes down. So, our ray finned fishes are the first of the ostichthians with lung or lung derivatives, and also a bony skeleton, a skeleton made of true bone or calcium phosphate tissue. And so an ostichthian also has jaws, so it's a nathostome with a bony skeleton and lung, a lung, or more lungs, or lung derivative. Now most ray finned fishes, of course, don't have lungs, but they will have a lung derivative called a swim bladder. In the lobe finned fishes, which are our next group of organisms on the tree, our lobed finned fishes are the first group of what we call lobe fins. 
And so the lobed fin fishes will include coelacanths and lung fishes. Um, these two fit types of fish right here are much different than ray finned fishes because instead of having rayed fins, they have a lobed fin. And what that means, so lobed fin, lobe fins are osteichthyans with limbs or appendages like fins supported by a muscular rod instead of a ray of bones. And tetrapods are lobe fins that have four limbs with digits. And that is going to be an important adaptation that will allow for the support of weight on land. So the um, tetrapods are lobe fins that have libs, limbs with digits, and our amphibians are going to be the first of those. Our three groups of tetrapods are amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. And reptiles and mammals are going to be called amniotes because of their terrestrial adapted egg called an amniotic egg. So finally, we've got an amniote, and an amniote is a tetrapod that has a terrestrial adapted egg called an amniotic egg. And if we complete this chart all the way down to the end, our last group are the mammals, and we have mammals being um, amniotes that produce milk. Or they have mammary, mammary glands. Okay. So back on this chart right here, we have covered the tunicates already because they are invertebrates and we've covered the hagfish. So in today's lecture, we are going to talk about Sorry, we've covered the lancelets and the tunicates, not the hagfish. Today's lecture, we're going to cover all of the animals or all of the chordates that are not tetrapods. So we'll talk about the hagfish, the lampreys, the chondrichthians, the ray finned fishes, and the lobed fin fishes. And the tetrapods will be our next lecture. All right, so starting with the hagfish. The hagfish are our first group of vertebrates and they are cyclostomes. So cyclostomes means circle mouth. Um, stoma usually refers to mouth or opening, and cyclo refers to circle. And so you see it's not a mouth with jaws, but more of a circle. Our lampreys, I'm gonna show you a picture of their mouth as well. Circle mouth. So the, lamprey, the lampreys and the hagfish are cyclostomes, and I remember those circle-shaped mouths. They do have very few vertebrae um, and a cartilage skeleton with no jaw and a small brain. Um, they eat with these tooth-like keratin um, formations that surround the mouth and um, they belong to the class Agnatha along with the lamprey. They are scavengers, so that means that they're not Predators, they don't eat living animals, but they'll scavenge on um, dead animals that fall to the bottom of the ocean. So they're marine scavengers, and a notable feature that they have are these slime glands. So I don't have that in bold, but I'd like to show you this video right here that shows you how effective these slime glands are at um, escaping predation. Should have had that up already.
Here we go. And where's the volume? But the shark is in for a big surprise. A shark sees an inviting meal, an eel-like fish with no visible defenses. But the shark is in for a big surprise, choked with slime oozing from hundreds of pores in the fish's body. Researcher Ben Sonsin Zan from the Museum of New Zealand Te Papa Tongarea and his colleagues went near New Zealand's Great Barrier Island and dropped remote cameras. Attached to the apparatus are blue lights to be as unobtrusive as possible and a bait bag. Here, at more than a 2,000-foot depth, some of the first to attack the bait were hagfish, also known as snot eels. At one point, a kite fin shark uninterested in the bait instead prefers the hagfish, but gets a mouthful of slime. The slime fills the shark's mouth, clogs its gills, and chokes it. The hagfish were seen repeatedly bitten by larger fish, all retreating with the same results. Here, a cat shark seems to be fine in biting down on the hagfish, but eventually turns away as it too is gagged by slime. More than a dozen prey attempts against the hagfish were recorded. Not one was successful. Hagfish have been around more than 300 million years, predating the dinosaurs. Besides their ability to slime attackers, they're equipped with four rows of teeth. Zinzan and his colleagues made 165 video deployments and published their findings in the journal Scientific Reports. All right, so these slime glands are an important adaptation that um, help the hagfish to escape predation. Okay, so we don't have jaws. They can still eat food. Um, but they are our first group of vertebrates. And I would like to discuss in general how vertebrates or chordates, um, uh, how the vertebrae are good evolutionary adaptations. So if this is the backbone right here, and we've got our vertebrae or our spinal cord, our dorsal hollow nerve cord, and we've got vertebrae surrounding it. We have muscles attached to these ends or attached to the vertebrae and chordates are segmented and the vertebrae help support that nerve cord and protect it. So animals that have segments and muscles attached to those segments can move more rapidly um, in, in an aqueous solution. So in, you know, a jellyfish, let's say you're a jellyfish, you can kind of bob up and down, move around in the water like this. If you are a hagfish, you know, you can slither and swim much more quickly. I apologize for the poor visual there. Um, but segmented um, animals such as the chordates um, allow for a more streamlined movement through water. Um, so that makes for more effective swimming. And with um, the vertebrae, you've got more protection of that dorsal hollow nerve cord. Okay. Our lampreys are another group of the class Agnatha, or the second type of cyclostome or circle mouth. They also have this, um, these keratin teeth and they can bore themselves. So they're parasitic because they bore themselves inside other animals, like this um, fish right here, in order to um, ingest the insides of that animal. So um, they are vertebrates, cyclostomes. They have a cartilage skeleton. They live in aquatic environments and they are parasitic rather than predatory since they actually lodge themselves inside the body of a vertebrate fish. And lamprey was once considered a delicacy. Um, it still is in some cultures. Um, it's a very famous dish that you um, will read about in um, literature. It was... Um, a, a considered a delicacy by ancient Romans throughout the Middle Ages and was a, a dish eaten by upper class. And um, 
if anybody watches Game of Thrones, lamprey pie was um, often considered um, a noble treat among the Lannister lineage. And if you haven't seen Game of Thrones, this time is a good time to just start some binge watching. All right. So now we're going to move on to the Chondrichthians. The, the Chondrichthians include the sharks and rays and relatives. On our phylogenetic tree, chondrichthians are the first of the naphastomes, which means these are the first vertebrate lineage that will have jaws. So naphastomes are vertebrates that have jaws, and this is a very important adaptation because jaws allow um, animals to ingest food that's bigger than its mouth. So you can feed on larger prey. And jaws, of course, are very powerful so that um, if you are going to be a good predator, if you're a good predator, you're going to be able to move well and attack well. And so we've already discussed how vertebrates have that more efficient movement compared to a jellyfish. Um, they also can have a better... Um, ability to eat their prey because they can chew or tear things apart um, that are larger than itself. Then chondrichthians include sharks, rays, and other types of relatives, which we'll casually call the cartilage fish, but of course they are not true fish. They are found in marine environments and are known as predators, but they can also be suspension feeders. So not all sharks are predatory. Uh, as far as reproduction goes, eggs are fertilized internally um, inside the female's body, and the development of the fetus can be one of three different types. So we're going to define some new words here. The first is oviparous. This means that development will, of the um, embryo and the fetus will occur inside an egg. So even though eggs are fertilized internally, they can be laid after fertilization and development will occur in the egg, but outside of the mother's body. In viviparous development, this is closer to what happens in humans. In viviparous um, for, um, development, the embryo and fetus develops inside the mother's body, and then there's a live birth. All right, so this is rare in chondrichthians, but it does happen. Another mode of development is called ovoviviparous. So if oviparous is inside an egg, viviparous is inside the mother's body, and then there's a live birth, Ovoviviparous is sort of a combination of the two above. Ovoviviparous development happens when the embryo develops inside the egg, but that egg resides within the mother's body or another parent. there are certain male species that can carry a developing egg. After it's been fertilized. Okay, we had mentioned this before, but they uh, caught the naphastomes are the first group to have a, a, a mineralized skeleton. The skeleton of sharks and rays it consists of calcium fortified cartilage. So it's a cartilage skeleton, um, so that's why we call them the cartilage fish. Chondrichthians have paired fins. They use gas for gill, gi um, gills for gas exchange, respiratory system, and they have a two-chambered heart. One chamber that receives the blood, one chamber that pumps the blood. So just one atrium and one ventricle. And this is not what a two-chambered heart actually looks like. Okay, we're going to be moving on to the Ostichthians. And the first group of Ostichthians are the ray-finned fishes. 
And so I'm going to attempt to draw one of these fins here because this is going to be a notable feature that distinguishes these fish or the common fishes from the lobed fin fishes. So the ray fin fishes are osteichthians, which means they're nathostomes that have a lung or a lung derivative. Specifically, the ray fin fishes have a lung derivative called a swim bladder. So the swim bladder is an evolutionary derivative of a lung. It's similar to a lung in that it's an air sac. It can fill with air and then deflate, just like the lungs do. Fill with air, get bigger, deflate. Fill with air, get bigger, deflate. Instead of this being used for gas exchange, it's used for buoyancy. When you fill with air, you become lighter and you go up in the water column. When you exhale and those lungs deflate, of course they're not really exhaling, they're not really breathing. Um, when the swim bladder deflates, uh, it loses that air, it gets more dense and it'll go down in the water column. So fish can control their position in the water column by pulling gases out of water into the swim bladder. So um, holding or expelling gases. However, gills are gonna be used for gas exchange. These swim bladders, despite being a lung derivative, are not used for gas exchange. All right, our osteichthians are the first with a bony skeleton. This means that the skeleton, it, uh, there is some cartilage component to it, but the mineral structure of the bone is calcium phosphate. So they're true bony fish, which is why we call the ray fin fishes the bony fishes. The fins are gonna be supported by bony rays. So if this is sort of the shoulder um, of the fish or the joint supporting the fin, then you have bones extending like this. And then the fins, yay, look like that. And there might be some more bones. But for the most part, the bones coming off the joint are in a rayed format. So that's why we call them the ray finned fishes. And the vast majority of all fish you'll ever see in your life are going to be the ray finned fishes. So we have tuna, lionfish, um, seahorses, eels. I know we called hagfish the snot eels or the slime eels, but real eels are actually fish. And then we have our eels from Disney's The uh, Little Mermaid, Flotsam and Jetsam. Okay. Next we have the lobed fin fishes. Lobed, lobe fins are osteichthians that have fins or limbs supported by muscular rods. So I want to draw what that fin looks like um, in the lobed fin fish compared to what we saw with the ray fin fishes. And so tetrapods will be our next group of lobe fins, but we are going to see that in part two of this lecture. So we won't talk about the tetrapods today, rather we'll just talk about the lobed fin fishes. So if this is a joint right here, let's say that's the shoulder, instead of there being multiple bones in a rayed format, you just have one bone. And then after that, there might be two more bones. And then the fin kind of goes like that. Yay. So this structure of the lobed fin fish, of this lobed fin, and then there's muscles around this bone, is similar to the humor, humerus radius and ulna of the arm, or the femur, tibia, and fibula of the leg. So this fin right here has a similar structure to the limb of a tetrapod. Fun fact. We've got two major coelacanths of lobed fin fishes, the coelacanths and the lung fishes. Coelacanths are deep sea fish. They were thought to have been extinct um, 
they it was thought that they had gone extinct, you know, um, 400 million years ago. Oh, no, that's when it evolved. It was thought to have gone extinct a million years ago, but it was actually discovered more recently in 1938 off the coast of South Africa. So this is a more recently discovered fish that was once thought to have been extinct. Um, there are only two species of this fish. They're found only in oceans. They actually have a hollow spine that's um, and notochord that's filled with an oil. And... Um, they're very long living. They can give live birth. Um, so the development of their young is ovoviviparous and their gestation period is three years. So all these fun facts, they're not written in the text here. So you don't need to know them. You don't need to know the um, respiratory or circulatory system of the coelacanths or the reproduction, um, but they're very, very interesting creatures. And this coelacanth right here, is um, unfortunately died on the way up. So it was um, a attempted to bring it into captivity, but it did not survive um, the change in pressure going um, up. And so now that coelacanth is in display, and it was last seen by me at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. So I was very excited when I saw that. The lungfishes are the other group of lobed fin fishes, and these are unique in that they can actually breathe through both lungs and gills, so their respiratory system consists of both. They are also very long-living, and there was one that was in Shedd's Aquarium that was the oldest um, lungfish in captivity. It um, had been in Shedd's Aquarium, which is in Chicago, since 1933, but sadly it died a couple of years ago. Um, and like the coelacanths, there are very few species of lungfishes, only six species. So combined, we have about eight species of lobed fin fishes, whereas, you know, there are thousands and thousands of species of ray fin fishes. So these two are quite rare. That's all for today. Next up, we are going to start talking about the tetrapods and the fossil evidence that links the fish to the tetrapods. Hope you all have a good week.